This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Now let's get started. I'd like to welcome you again to today's webinar entitled Project Innovation Through Design Thinking. Today's session is being sponsored by the Stanford Center for Professional Development and the Stanford Advanced Project Management Certificate Program. It is my pleasure today to introduce Professor Pamela J. Hines and Michael Berry, two esteemed colleagues and subject matter experts on design thinking and innovation. Professor Hines is an associate professor in management science and engineering and the co-director of the Center for Work, Technology, and Organizations at Stanford. Her research and teaching leverage the social sciences, organizational behavior in particular to understanding the effects of technology on groups and teams and organizations. Professor Hines is currently researching how design practices and design thinking vary in different regions around the world. She believes that culture, context, shapes the practices that are possible and appropriate in different settings and that honoring these differences is the key to innovation. Michael Berry is a consulting assistant professor in the D design school in the mechanical engineering department at Stanford University, where he teaches need finding and cross-cultural design. Michael is also a guest lecturer at the Harvard School of Business and University of California Haas School of Business. A founder of Point Forward, Michael has over two decades of experience providing strategic innovation at the cr critical early stages of the product development process. He has restructured research and innovation processes, provided strategic project management, and designed over 80 products from mainframes to disposable diapers. His clients include Sony, IBM, Nestle, Wells Fargo, Wrigley, and many other companies. His teams have received numerous awards from ID Magazine, IDSA, and Business Week. I'd like to welcome Pam Hines and Michael Berry. Thank you, Robert. So today we're going to uh, talk about project innovation uh, through design thinking. And um, then we'll have a little bit um, about how to learn, learn more about these courses and uh, follow it up with about 10 minutes of Q&A. So our objective for today is to give you some familiarity with the design thinking process and some insight into how it can be used to reframe project opportunities for um, people who are working on projects, project managers, um, and so forth. So let me start with a couple of quick examples um, of how people have used the design thinking process to make changes in their organizations. Um, first, um, Embrace, which is a small startup company in Palo Alto, um, created a portable incubator um, focused on saving the lives of babies in developing countries. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on that case in a few minutes. JetBlue, a domestic U.S. airline, um, used design thinking as well as lean processes um, to really rethink their um, business operations. Um, as a result, they went from a cost of $41 million to recover from an ice storm in 2007 to a cost of about $10 million for the one that happened in 2010, um, in large part due to some of the operational changes that they made. Um, in a project um, that we did on global aging, um, we interviewed um, seniors around the globe and learned that remaining independent isn't actually a value um, in all cultures. Um, we discovered in China um, that, in fact, seniors weren't lonely. They had actually really active social lives, but they missed their children and grandchildren um, who had left to pursue other opportunities in distant regions or countries. And that suggested a very different kind of product or service opportunity to support um, these seniors in China. Um, and then finally, um, working with the American Heart Association, um, they came to us saying that they actually had a problem with CPR training in China. Um, people simply weren't signing up and learning to do CPR. Um, when going in to really understand this problem in China, um, our team discovered that, in fact, um, 
Training wasn't really the issue, but it was that um, if somebody had a cardiac incident um, in China, um, the likelihood of them surviving was actually quite low. Um, and the last person who touched them would actually be held accountable um, for their death. So there was a real risk to people if they actually used CPR um, in China, um, which suggested a real reframing of the problem to one that was much more about policy and helping people to see the value of being heroes and actually doing CPR um, in that context. So what is design thinking? Well, it's a philosophy and it's a mindset. It's really a mindset around how you approach problems and opportunities. And one of the beliefs that we have um, in design thinking is that just about everything we encounter every day is designed. Um, anything that's not nature, of course, the, the trees and, and grass and so forth are not designed by people. Um, but just about everything else, this, this webinar, the computer that you're working on, the seat, that, the chair that you're sitting in, um, just about everything you encounter um, has been designed by somebody. And that's true for processes that we encounter, services that we encounter, and so forth. And just about everything could be designed better. There's a real opportunity um, to improve um, the experiences that people have. So the focus of design thinking is really on redesigning experiences, experiences of products, experiences of services, for example, when you go to restaurants or hotels, and experiences of processes, for example, um, HR processes, uh, reviews, um, you know, performance management in organizations, operational processes, and so forth. In all of those cases, they are experienced by people, um, and it's important to understand that experience in order to um, improve those products, services, or processes. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on a few of these case studies to give you a sense of um, how they're being used, but also a sense of the process, starting with Embrace. So 140 million babies die each year. Four million of those die in the first 28 days of life, um, and most of those are in developing countries around the world. So this uh, team um, at Stanford was challenged with um, an opportunity to design a less expensive incubator. So the cost of incubators is around $20,000, and they were asked to design an incubator that cost no more than $300, with the idea being that if there were more incubators available um, at a lower cost, they'd be able to um, help these fragile children to survive those um, past the first 28 days of life. So what this team did was they went into um, the context. They went to India, and they looked at the hospitals, and they looked at the incubators, and they thought about um, how people were actually using um, these incubators in the hospital environment. So... What do you notice? Just take a, a second to write down what you notice about these pictures that are on your screen. Okay, so there are two things that I want to point out. One is there's actually a lot of incubators. Um, one of the things that they found when they went into these hospitals is even though incubators cost $20,000 or more, they were actually um, readily available in the hospitals that they went into in these urban areas. The other thing that you might notice is that these incubators are empty. So what they found was that, in fact, the incubators were there, but the babies weren't making their way into the hospitals in order to be put into the incubators. So the team then went to the village and tried to understand why the babies weren't making it to the incubators. Um, and the problem was that the babies, again, these are fragile children, early days of life, often born premature, often very low birth weight, and they were simply too fragile 
to make the journey into the urban areas to be placed in these incubators. So what the team did then was reframe the problem. They said the problem is not building a cheaper incubator. The problem is finding a way to transport these very fragile babies from these rural villages into the towns where the hospitals were and where the incubators were located. So they went back, um, they brainstormed, they did a lot of prototyping, built over 100 prototypes, and they ended up with a um, sleeping bag type of um, ar um, architecture um, that had a very special uh, insert with phase change materials that would keep the babies warm as they were being transported, um, and it didn't rely on electricity, which was um, really critical. But they didn't stop there. They then went back into these villages and got feedback from people. They found out how the mothers would actually hold these, how they would put the babies in, what were the fears and taboos around using these, how would they carry them from the villages into the city and so forth. Um, and they then ordered that feedback back into um, the design of the product, which ended up looking something like this. So the solution uh, looks pretty simple, um, but incubators have been around um, for over 100 years um, and have been a standard for treating premature babies. So it's not just a new product, but a paradigm that has the potential to rewrite how um, the babies are treated, um, especially where the product or the problem is really occurring. Okay, so that was an example of a product, um, and some of you out there might be saying, well, you know, we're project managers. We don't design products. We design processes and work with um, project teams. Well, I want to share with you now a little bit more detail on the JetBlue case, um, because this is about um, operational excellence. So... What JetBlue found was that different parts of the organization were acting independently. Um, for example, the system controller in the command center um, has to make a decision about canceling a flight. But he or she has no idea how that decision might affect the reservation agent, for example, who's located in Salt Lake City, or the flight attendants who have to be um, rescheduled and um, fly on different flights. So one of the things they started with was building empathy, focusing on understanding the next person in the process. So somebody in the command center, for example, um, went to Salt Lake City to try to understand, well, you know, how do the reservation agents actually do their job? What do they do? And how do my decisions or how might my decisions actually affect their ability to do their work? So they lived in the other guy's shoes in order to be able to um, build this empathy. The result of all this um, was the realization that they needed to be much more consistent in how they handled events, um, especially what was considered a large versus a small disruption. You know, it was a disruption, you know, a large disruption, 20 flights, 40 flights, 100 flights being canceled. Um, do they have to be delayed just one hour, two hours, six hours? Does it matter whether it's JFK, a huge airport, or Palm Beach, a small airport? What they ended up doing was developing this chart that um, identified what was a large disruption, what was a small disruption, and how each of those would play out in terms of the communication, the processes, what got canceled, and how that would be handled. So this framework, which was... Operation Plan B, um, was then prototyped repeatedly over about a year. Um, they talked with potential users to understand the impact that it would have on them. They thought about how they would use it um, and what it would mean for their jobs and their ability to serve customers. Um, it was finally rolled out in February of 2009, and um, as of October 2011, there actually hadn't been any changes to it. They'd gotten it to the point where it was really working effectively for them. Um, so now I'm going to show you a video um, that um, was of um, employees at JetBlue and their response to this program.
Okay, so that gives you an idea of how it actually changed uh, the experience of employees at JetBlue. So what is this design thinking process? I've given you a couple of cases that illustrate the process, but now I want to um, show you an actual diagram that captures it. And two things I want to point out about uh, this diagram. One, one of the things you might notice is that the define, defining the problem, actually doesn't happen at the beginning. Um, so, for example, with the embrace, you know, defining the problem might be build a cheaper incubator. But in fact, the problem doesn't get defined until after this empathy stage, really understanding, observing, getting a sense of um, what it is that people need. And um, in just a minute or two, Michael's going to go into much more detail on that part of the process. The other thing I want to point out here is that although this looks linear, you know, going with understanding on the left to test on the right, in fact, there are a lot of little lines and loops um, between, um, and that's meant to capture how iterative this process is meant to be and how important it is to um, learn and then return to earlier stages of the process in order to refine um, the ideas that are being developed. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michael Barry, who's going to be talking um, in more detail about some aspects of the design thinking process. Great. Thank you, Pam. Enjoyed that. Um, back to the question of why are we doing design thinking? Isn't this just smart people figuring out problems? And we would say that um, it's not just smart people figuring out problems, but the nature of the problem that's being asked of them and providing them tools that um, – actually allow them to, to deal with a different quality and kind of problem. So to, to give you an example of what I mean, um, what's the answer to this problem? Um, five plus five, I'll let you all think of that in your heads. Um, I actually asked that uh, from a group of auditors last week, and it took me five minutes to get an answer. This is not a trick question. So the answer is, Ten, yes, one one answer, and no one should have had too much trouble with it. Um, what's the answer to this problem? Okay, question plus question equals ten. And I may get some answers. The first round are, oh, there's probably a hundred answers. Oh, there's maybe a thousand. Well, there's an infinite number of answers here. And as we get into imaginary numbers, et cetera, um, what's the very first question you should be asking as you look at this, and it's, well, why do I want 10? Because until I know why I want 10, I can't even begin to address the infinite number of solutions possible. That's the kind of problem design thinking is good for, and the fundamental kind of dumb questions we have to ask in order to practice it. So um, this uh, uh, category of problem uh, has been referred to as wicked problems. Um, it sometimes gets mixed up with systems theory, et cetera, but the point is you're dealing with multivariable problems where there's imperfect knowledge, right? So let's look at another example about why we are doing design thinking. Um, so I'm going to ask you guys, what's this? Um, and for those of you... Uh, 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 who have been purchasing uh, house cleaning products. It is the latest uh, vacuum cleaner from iRobot. It travels around your house, sucks up dirt, um, finds its way back to its recharging station, quite obedient, programmable, kind of a cute thing, and doing pretty well. Now you'd ask, you know, why am I showing this as an example of this new kind of wicked problem, right? It's just a vacuum cleaner that's maybe a little smarter than other vacuum cleaners. I, I think the point is there's a very big difference between iRobot and arguably the Dyson, which is best vacuum on the block. And I'd throw out to you guys, uh, what's the difference between these two? But by the way, the iRobot doesn't suck all that well. It has little multiple... Uh, uh, suction and cleaning, but compared to the Dyson, it doesn't do so well. And it has to do with this notion of reframing the problem. Uh, Dyson is kind of the uh, final 
perfect sucking machine. It's what the industry has defined as a good product, a vacuum that sucks better. And Dyson did an amazing job engineering it, getting rid of the bag, using all kinds of Venturi and Vortex technologies. Um, but at the end of the day, you still have to use it. Uh, iRobot, on the other hand, came from a company that manufactured minesweepers. Um, these minesweepers were relatively autonomous, found their way across battlefields, located mines, exploded them, and they asked themselves, what else could we do with our very sophisticated technology in another field? And they thought about, well, what about vacuuming homes? And iRobot was born. What's interesting is as you turn it on, it says, have patience. I don't clean as well as other vacuums, but I'll be cleaning all the time. I'll be cleaning in places you can't get to, or I'll be cleaning when you're doing something else. What was done here was a fundamental reframe, and a reframe, by the way, that the vacuum cleaner companies themselves could never get to. And if any of you have any doubts about iRobot, um, it's currently being looked at, certainly in Silicon Valley, as the very first successful home robot. Um, it's the lead into essentially a new, um, I would argue, generation of products that are about to come. So keep eyes on it, but it's a fascinating reframe. Um, so reframing problems in very interesting ways. And the point of the reframe is it opens the opportunity space. It gives you a different set of solutions than you had before. So let's look at this one more time. And this was um, an exercise done in an entrepreneurship class at Stanford by Tina Selig. And I'll ask you guys, I'm going to give you an envelope. And inside the envelope is $5. Once you open the envelope, you have two hours to make as much money as you possibly can. Now, that should get some people's hearts beating. So think about what would you do? What would you do with five bucks and two hours, right? Now, you're on campus. Um, so start kind of imagining, what's the things you would do? We had a, a Chinese group here, and they all said, oh, we'd run to the bookstore, we'd buy T-shirts, and we'd sell them, right? We'd sell them back. We'd make lots of money. And how much more money? Oh, we'd pay double our money, maybe triple it, right? So now that you've kind of thought about the things you'd do, what did our students do? Well, let me tell you what the three top students came up with. So number three. Number three went out, and they bought a bicycle pump with the $5. And over the two hours, they went out in the middle of campus where everyone's riding bicycles, and they said, $1, and we will fill up your tires, right? We'll reinflate your tires. Well, they didn't do so good, right? The money wasn't coming in. So after the next half hour, they reduced it from a dollar to $0.25, cents, weren't getting anybody. And then somebody said, oh, heck, let's just, We'll do it for free and give us donations. They made 50 bucks. Things completely changed. $50 after two hours. So they came back feeling really good. So that was number three. Number two in the class said, oh, you know what? You know, I, I think the $5 is a red herring. Right. They've given it to us, but we don't have to use that. It's the time. The time is what's valuable here, right? So it's time and, and our effort. So. They went out to University Avenue on Stanford where there are all kinds of restaurants Friday night and just packed as can be, lines everywhere, and they did line sitting, right? They took the team members. They said, for $10, we will hold your place in line, right? You can go shop. When you come back, we'll, we'll, we'll have your cell phone, right? We'll alert you to when you're ready to go. That team made $250, Two hundred and fifty out of five dollars. What was number one? What was number one? Number one, team one, she named it was uh, Yusuke, Japanese student. Figured this one out. He said, "You know what? The five dollars and the two hours all are red herrings. They're getting in the way. That's not what's of most value." By the way, and I, the the presentation, all of the results were being presented. Uh, to the entrepreneurship group and to the class, and they were being presented uh, that students would have 15 minutes. He recognized that the most valuable thing they had to offer was the presentation time. He sold the presentation time 
to Cisco to pitch a hundred of the most talented entrepreneurs at Stanford. He sold it for six thousand dollars. Okay, so an example of what you can do with design thinking. Okay, with reframing, and I, I put up this slide. And certainly what we're talking about is not a new problem, right? And the problem is a wise leader, a wise designer, a wise manager must first define the right problem to solve in the first place, right? And to recognize what the value is or what the issues are that are critical, not just points of pain or accepting the assignment, but learning different ways to approach and challenge your problem. So um, I'm going to take one more pass. Uh, Pam gave you a kind of linear, uh, these are the activities around design thinking process. I want to give you another way of looking at the design thinking process that gets into both um, some of the tools and some of the ways of thinking that are involved in design thinking, because it's not just one way of thinking. So first, I want to start, and I'm going to give you a two by two, but within any design management activity, uh, there's usually two things we need to deal with. There's an analysis component and a synthesis component. In the analysis part, I need to take apart the problem, right? See its constituent parts. Ask why a lot. The synthesis is putting it back together, right? How do I accomplish putting it back together in a new way that will create new value, that will serve my customers better. So that's that's one continuum. There's another continuum, and we like to cross it, and a problem and my way of thinking about it, it'll be in the concrete world. It's actual. I can experience it. I can share those experiences. I can model that experience in some way and get concrete reactions. The other, when I'm defining a problem, is the abstract world. And the abstract world is the world of models, of ideas, where I conceptualize the problem and put it in simplified terms that I can mediate and work on and play with, okay? So that's the space design thinking exists in. And then let's look at the different quadrants and the kinds of activities that exist. Uh, the first one, when I'm in the kind of analytic space and concrete, I'm observing. I'm observing, hopefully with fresh eyes, and that's the hard part, but I'm observing, trying to understand what's going on, what are the issues, what are the complexities. And then as I move through, I hope from those observations to gain insights. I try to see that world in a new way. And in that insight, I may see contradictions, right, where someone tells me one thing and does another. Uh, like the infant case, I may just see something that others hadn't seen, right? Uh, there, where are the babies? And nobody had asked, where are the babies? That was a crucial insight. Or in the money, figuring out really what was a value. Then as I move through into the space, and now I'm shifting from the analytic side to the synthetic side, still in the abstract, I start coming up with ideas. Lots of ideas, right, about what's possible. From both my observation and my insight, I'm not just coming up with wacky ideas. I'm coming up with ideas that are consistent with the new knowledge I have, with the new frames, with how the culture works, but again, satisfying those needs, creating values in new ways. And lastly, I need to come up with actual solutions back in the real world that people can experience, that I can test, and once more, go into observations. So we've drawn this as a linear process, and as Pam said, yeah, we showed you a bunch of circles in order, but the reality is um, it isn't linear. It operates in uh, a very nonlinear way, but we kind of need to teach it in this fashion. Um, I'm going to show you this slide, and these are really the tools. These are the tools that exist within these spaces. And I'll just kind of walk through. Um, empathy is an absolutely key, key tool, and it sounds easy, right? You know, we, we say, oh, walk a mile in someone else's shoes. But we think of it uh, not just as understanding other people, but understanding them from their point of view, not ours. And, oh, that's a hard one. And you've got to ask really dumb why questions. 
and it's often hard for smart people to ask dumb questions. Uh, at the top, this thing called insight, and you know we've represented it sort of the Newtonian apple dropping on somebody's head. But it's that aha moment. It takes time. It takes collaboration. Sometimes the insight falls out. Sometimes you have to work at it very hard with models. And in the course, we'll be providing you with some of the ways we often use to garner insight. As we move into the synthesis side, uh, we've represented a diverge converge, where in divergent thinking, I'm coming up with lots of ideas, converging, how do I select those few key ones that are going to really help? There's another way of looking at this, and it has to do with a notion we refer to as powers of 10, uh, an Eames film that's brilliant, uh, and you may have seen as, as uh, uh, high school students. Um, it suggests that there are many different perspectives, and you're going to find a perspective in looking at the problem that suddenly ideas start to come out. It's this way of looking at it that it's generative. Um, lastly, we move into this notion of storytelling, and storytelling is something we find um, not just the end of delivery of a PowerPoint presentation, but something critical in both framing the problem in a way that an organization can take action on. So with that, to really simplify it, and that's a whole lot to remember and we don't expect you, at the end of the day, it's about figuring out what the story is and telling a new one. So I want to give you one more case study, another way to drill down a little deeper, and it's going to be looking at some needs, use, usability, meaning, and a story of acorns, a very old story of acorns. Um, it's a story that exists and came out of the California Central Valley, uh, 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 Fresno and Madera counties, and it involves the Native American uh, uh, Mono Indians. And these Indians uh, ate exclusively black and white acorns for their starch. Men hunted game. Women, as it turns out, uh, 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 took care of creating bread food from acorns. And next slide, uh, this is, and by the way, this is a story that lasted for thousands of years. Uh, and this picture was taken at the turn of the century. And you're seeing an Indian woman, uh, probably in her 70s, uh, on age unknown, but very senior woman, grinding acorns on what was referred to as a community mill. Essentially, uh, two pieces of granite, a uh, big one she's sitting on and the one in her hand, and she pounds acorns and separates the 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 inner meal, edible eel, from the shell. Uh, another view of that community mill, in order to feed the tribe, they had to have lots of people working together. Actually, all the women of the tribe were creating acorn meal, and it was a hard, back-breaking job. So I want to show you the next picture and imagine, and again, it's an interactive class, but I can only interact with the people here in the room. So with that, I'm going to throw it open. Uh, what are the needs this woman has? Looking at this picture. What are the needs this woman has? Yeah. <clears throat> Well, she needs acorns. She needs acorns. Absolutely. <laughs> that, and that, yes, that's it. So a post-it would go up on the wall. She needs acorns. She needs to feed her people. What, she, what other needs does she have? She needs the granite to grind those acorns. Well, she needs granite. Now, that's interesting because what you've said, and it's not wrong, but it's uh, kind of stated as a solution, right? And we like to think of needs as verbs. So what's the, what's the granite doing for her? It's breaking the acorns. But it's breaking the acorns. So she needs to break the acorns open. And what other needs does she have? Well, then I guess I would get into her personal needs. She needs the strength and the energy to do that. Absolutely. It takes a lot of strength. And i got to tell you, looking at this picture, I'm not sure I'd be up <laughs> for that. So strength and energy. And as we find, uh, certainly the engineering students hearing this are thinking about, gee, what are ways to to multiply her strength and energy and, gee, maybe I can come up with a better mortar and pestle that will optimize and break. So, as I said, we have all these things going on. Now, but let's keep going. What other needs do you see that she has? Manpower, more people to help her. Yeah, more people. So certainly all the women in the tribe, it turns out the children. Children are there as well. So we've kind of tapped out the manpower, but absolutely she needs lots of person power or certainly a multiplier 
to increase their output. What else? What other needs? A plan. <laughs> <laughs> she needs, and that's interesting because we've only shown you a single snapshot, but certainly there is a whole plan of everything from gathering the acorns, bringing them into the community uh, 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 rock, separating them, cooking them. So we've only saw your snapshot, and maybe understanding that larger plan would give us some sense of what to do. So just to stay with it a little longer, any other any other needs? And this is what we do with you guys. We keep asking you this question to your eyes cross. Anything else? Anything else? You know, um, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, I mentioned that it's hot, and uh, it, certainly the pictures suggest not much in the way of yeah, I need water. I maybe need some shade. We have a lot of folks who often go, wow, she looks uncomfortable. Gee, maybe if we could get her a chair, maybe we could support her work task in some way. All absolutely right. And what we're kind of starting with, and by the way, you hit, and, and, and these are looking at uh, a useful way of organizing needs. Uh, first one is use. Right? She needs acorns. She needs food. It's the explicit need task to be solved. And, and we're pretty good at, at understanding that. And we then get into this notion of usability. And most of the answers we get in regards to this have to do with how do we improve either the physical ergonomics, the co how do we make cognitive sense out of it, how do we help her achieve the use function, okay, the use needs. Then, as you might guess, especially from the engineering students who said, you know, she needs a better food processor, um, we're going to come up with a grinder. Well, in fact, the U.S. government did this and provided the uh, Mono Indians with whole 25, 30 grinders that they thought would satisfy them. Uh, now, I'm not sure what the Indians were doing with the sea clamp, but Nonetheless, they were given these grinders, which, as it turns out, were never used. They rusted in the rain. So what went wrong? It seems like the perfect solution, right? They could have multiples, use them inside. It would multiply the force. Everything worked. And the U.S. government kind of sat back and said, these people are just crazy. They're just nuts. I mean, not to use this and to help deal with their hunger problems. What they didn't look at was the meaning, right? What do acorns mean? And by the way, when approaching this problem, uh, and it's very common, we say it's a food processing problem, right? She doesn't have the right food processor. But let's look, and, and by the way, the meaning, these are the cultural stories, and I mentioned the term culture. This is what we focus on, right? It's the organizing frame, the emotional resonance, the expectations that these people have around any solution. So I'm going to take you through a quick interview, okay? So I, I would say, tell me about making acorns. And the answer might be, you know, it's really a hard time-consuming task, right? It's like, whoa, sounds like a grinder to me, huh? Next question. Um, well, how do you do acorns? Have you always done it this way? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, from the village to this boulder, you know, we've always come and done this. We work, you know, we sit, we pound acorns, we gossip. You know, we scold the children and, and we make food for the tribe. Now, a good interviewer, and this is something we try and teach, especially an ethnographic interviewer, tries to listen for the things that are outliers. And I'm talking about food. Then she's starting to talk about children and child care, and that's kind of interesting. So I may ask, you know, what are the children doing? Right? Well, you know, the children, they play nearby, and they can hear our stories and songs. Interesting. So a really astute interviewer, might ask about those songs. Well, you know, tell me about the songs and stories. Well, you know, we, we sing them to pass the time, and we, you know, tell stories and sing songs of our people and how they live in the world. And then I, if I'm really sharp, I say, could you sing me one of those songs? And, oh, by the way, does the song have anything to do with making acorns? And I get the answer, well, of course it does. Don't you know that? Where were you brought up? Everybody knows that. Acorns Oh, you're so dumb. The acorn is mother to us all. And this stone is where we give her life through that pounding and activity. And by doing that, she gives us life. What happened is 
So those grinders could in no way give life to the acorn. Now, this is an animistic people, and in their world, that was the nature of the process that was critical. And it was critical upon this meaning, and any solution needed to deal with that. Now, again, we could simply say, oh, there's nothing I can do, right? Or I can begin to acknowledge the needs that I heard and combine them with this new meaning and stop thinking of it as a food processing problem and potentially start thinking of it as a musical instrument problem. So with that, needs are gaps within use, usability, and meaning, and we innovate by creating new stories that bridge those gaps between all three, use, usability, and meaning. So with that statement, and we like to think that design thinking does more than simply make better things, making a better tool, okay? Yes, you can do that, but you can also make things better, right? And taking that larger view. With that, I'd like to turn it back over to Pam. Hey, thank you, Michael. Um, so we've talked um, a lot about the design thinking process um, and given a few examples. What I want to do is just sort of wrap it up and talk a little bit about project innovation, particularly um, in the project management space. So um, as we talked about at the beginning, design thinking is really about redesigning experiences of products, services, processes, um, and anything else really that creates an experience. And project management does that. It creates an experience for employees, for others in the organization, uh, for vendors, basically anyone that uh, the project management activity touches. So you might ask yourself the question, how might we create project management practices that, for example, lead to excitement and engagement among the people involved, create a more cohesive team, are more dynamic given the kind of speed and dynamism of the world in which we're working, are effective for millennials, this new generation that has really different needs and perhaps very different meanings that they associate with these processes, or um, ones that resonate with people around the globe or even around the organization that are coming from you know, really different perspectives. And these are just a couple of different examples. It really is, is meant to uh, be provocative, to help you get thinking about, well, what are some of the opportunities for innovation in the project management space? What are the meanings that people associate with things like design reviews, project plans, um, and so forth? So if we go back to the diagram that Michael talked about, first stage is figuring out the story. What is it that people are doing with these processes? How are they responding to them? What are the things that aren't working well? What are the things that just sort of rub or grate as people engage in this, these project management practices? What are the meanings of these things? You know, what does it mean to people when they go to a design review or when they present at a design review? How can we tap more into uh, the meanings that um, really resonate for people and begin to tell a new story um, that innovates project management in really important, radical ways that uh, dramatically improve uh, people's experience and the outcomes of the project management process. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Robert. Thank you. Thank you, Pam and Michael. At this time, we encourage you, the audience, to submit your questions about today's presentation. Our presenters will answer your questions in a couple of minutes. While we gather questions, I'd like to briefly share some information about the Stanford Advanced Project Management Certificate Program and a little bit more about this innovation course. In 1999, Stanford professor Ray Levitt partnered with the Stanford Center for Professional Development and IPS Learning to create this award-winning program focused on strategy execution and management of project-based work. 
This program uh, can be delivered in three ways on Stanford's campus via online streaming video and at work brought to your company site. To earn the designation of Stanford Certified Project Manager, participants complete three required courses and three elective courses from a variety of topics to create a customized curriculum. Our presenters today are faculty in the innovation course entitled Project Innovation Through Design Thinking. The course will be offered September 19th through the 21st um, of this year. So before we move to the question and answer portion of today's presentation, I would like to open our second poll of the day. What is your level of interest in the SAPM certificate program? I am interested in attending this course on innovation. I'm interested in attending a course in September on campus, but not quite sure which one. I'm interested in bringing the SAPM program to my company. I'm interested in the online courses or not sure. Send me more information about the program and let me decide. And the last one is I'm already currently enrolled. I just wanted to see what you guys are up to now. Okay, the polls will close in a few seconds, but please keep um, clicking your answers. And the polls are now closed. Great, thank you very much for, for your feedback. Now we'll go on to the question and answer uh, portion of today's presentation. Pam and Michael, our first question is, I hear it's all about empathy and brainstorming, but how do I make this actionable? Okay, um, great question. Um, I think a lot of companies have gone through kind of design innovation processes and the sense that um, lots and lots of ideas come out, but you don't quite know what to do with them. And I think it's actually only looking at a small part of the process. And I think the issue about both understanding people deeply as a way to give you a better set of solutions, the other and more important one is this notion of reframing. And I know we feel like we're, we're, we're talking about that a great deal, but the sense of finding out not just what is the right problem you should be working on is crucial, but more importantly, finding different ways to begin to access that problem, right? And I talk about opportunity space, creating not just a set of answers, but a different set of opportunity spaces that starts to give you very different answers than you had before or begins to suggest different kinds of strategy on how to use those answers. So for us, ideation is important, but only a small part of a, a, a larger way of thinking. Yeah, let me just add to that. Um, we talked, as, as Michael said, a lot about sort of the empathy and the reframing piece in the time that we had today. Um, but there are other pieces of the design thinking process that are also really crucial that we didn't have time to really drill down into. Um, and one of those is the, the prototyping process, which is a really, really important process for beginning to um, make concrete these ideas. Um, make them concrete, have the team engaged in making them concrete, and then use them to go back out, um, for example, in the JetBlue case, to take that operations plan, go back out, interact with people around it, figure out how it's going to be used, and then improve it so that it really, in fact, does meet the need um, and will, in fact, um, be effective um, at doing what it's meant to in the organization. So those are really, that, that loop that Michael showed you is a really um, important piece, looping back around, getting that feedback, and changing our understanding of the problem so that we really get it right. Great. Um, our next question is, this sounds great, but I can't do it alone. Uh, how can I actually do it in my organization? Pam, I'll let you wrestle on that one. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a great question, um, and we get that uh, frequently where people say, you know, it, it's, um, you know, 
it takes multiple people to do this. I can't just do design thinking on my own. Um, and that's absolutely true. It's really about creating a culture in the organization that values spending time doing this kind of upfront work rather than the very, very natural tendency to jump from, jump right into defining the problem. That's what organizations typically do. Um, so a lot of it is working with other people in the organization um, to lead this process um, and bring others on board and help them to see the value of it. Um, in the course, one of the things that we will be talking about is leading innovation that speaks to this directly. Um, and there's also another SAPM course on uh, managing from the middle, I think it is, that um, um, helps to um, it helps project managers to see how to make change across the organization from the position that they're in. Yeah, just to add to that, um, you're not going to come out of a two-hour session ready to be a design thinker and, and hang out your shingle. And that's not to say you won't have tools that you will use in your everyday worlds. Uh, we, we've had lots of chemies who have learned mind mapping and are now drawing all over their fume hoods and their colleagues are wondering where they can get some of that. And that's great. We love that. But what we found, by and large, is that for organizations, um, simply having an executive director of Do More Design Thinking doesn't work so well. What does work are having people work on real projects using these tools where both they're committed, they have skin in the game, and the projects are such that those wins that they get can be communicated to the larger organization. And this gets to the the leading from the middle. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question is, how do you know when you are there, the right question, the right solution? This tends to be um, a common question um, from the participants. Okay, another great one. And you certainly know you're there when you've run out of time and money. <laughs> and as a consultant, that's that. That tells you real quick. But but seriously, uh, when Pam talks about iteration, the iteration is the central way that you begin to find out if, uh, and it's both iteration and prototyping. Those two things are crucial. The iteration, every pass through you are getting closer to satisfying those needs. And it's not just simply sort of giving the Hail Mary, hoping it lands pass, but you are, in by operating both in the tangible space and understanding how those prototypes are working, not working, how you're building on the theories to see how they work. It's that combination that begins to let you know if you're on the right track. Absolutely, and I, just to add quickly to what you've said, Michael, is going back to the, the needs again, going back to that, that um, place of understanding and linking back to what um, you've begun to understand about users. What I've um, seen fairly frequently is, is once we get over onto the uh, prototyping and the solution side, that can sort of spin out of control into really cool solutions, but it's critical to then reach back um, and test that with, you know, what did we learn? How would this person actually feel about this particular solution so that um, there's this constant testing in our own minds as well as directly with users? Um, and just, this is a really important question. One other piece, and, and Pam said you got a prototype, and for a lot of people it's like, well, it's, it's going to cost us, you know, $3 million to prototype. And we would push back and say there are a lot of very different ways of prototyping, of displacing people's activities. Once you've built this knowledge of frameworks and culture and how things are going, you can have people behave and act in very different ways, ways that you hope they will around your product or service and gauge how that product or service will work without, in fact, having to go through the $3 million of building it. And a lot of creative approaches. Um, we will talk about that as well. Great. And um, our last question is, um, how do you in incorporate regulations around 
that dominate your work um, to design your projects. Uh, some a lot of participants have regulations that change often. Um, thoughts on redesigning and rescoping as these change? Yeah, that's that's another really great question. Um, you know, I think our tendency is to see um, regulations and and other inputs of that sort as constraints, um, and. And at some level, they are constraints, right? But they're also the opportunity space. And what's really critical is to to or those into the process and um, incorporate them into that that solution space, so that they actually um, so the solution actually works with those regulations. Now, in terms of changing regulations, um, you know that's. That's a little bit more challenging because it, it suggests much more dynamic kinds of project management processes. Um, and I guess I would be inclined to think of that as a need in the process of designing um, more suitable project management processes. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, along those lines, and we've just finished uh, working for a group of auditors, and trust me, they have more regulations than you can imagine. And what they have discovered is um, they've kind of stopped thinking, right? The regulations are an excuse because I, there's just nothing else we can do. This is what's dictated. And they're now coming to the recognition that innovation and design thinking are opening back up. Yeah, we have to serve the regulations, but there are a whole set of experiences we have been ignoring and that we can design to as well. So to Pam's point, the regulations aren't an end, Right, they're they're a necessary beginning for your solution space, but you can open up beyond there. And just I know we're wrapping up here, but just to add one more example, um, in the medical device space, we're using a lot of design thinking in the medical device uh, medical device space, um, and that's highly regulated. Um, but um, the real opportunity is to be able to design within that space and take into account. Um, the regulations that exist. Great. Thank you, uh, Pam and Michael. This concludes the question and answer portion for today. Um, thank you for attending today's webinar, Project Innovation Through Design Thinking. As a reminder, you may now print a PDF of the slides by selecting the Print to PDF option from the File menu at the upper, upper navigation bar. For those of you that weren't able to get audio on the video, we will be sending out a uh, link to that video along with the recorded version of the webinar for you to view um, once those are up and available. Um, there are still many questions in the queue. We will stay uh, in the live meeting to answer a few more questions for those kind of hanging out there. Um, so please, uh, for those of you that your answers were, quite, uh, were answered, uh, please disconnect, and for those of you, we suggest that you stay on. Thank you.